Hello and welcome to yet another Rivet tutorial. Uh, we already covered lots of the basics, so today we are talking about retrieval augmented generation. Um, yeah, we will go through a simple example and if you don't know what it is about yet, I think this will also help you understand uh, why you should use it or why you could use it. Uh, same as for the last video, sorry for the audio quality and no video, but I'm still traveling with my laptop, so uh, this can't be helped, so you might be hearing my mouse clicking or other stuff. Uh, yeah, will be better in the future again. But let's just get started. Um, this example is based on our web scraping uh, tutorial I already did. So basically what we are doing here is we are fetching some URL and we want to ask questions about the content. And previously, we created a very simple or multiple ways to scrape the web. I used the most simple one here, which can just run Rivet without any additional tools. So we are just using some subgraphs like scrape which, uh, with HTTP call, which I already created in this uh, in the other project. If you're interested in this, um, just go to the other video and you can see all the explanations about it. But um, let's just run this first. Um, there's one big issue with it. Um, when we do this, we are already stripping, we're getting the raw HTML from the website. And even though I created functions to uh, strip all the HTML code out, there is still lots of um, content in there that has no relevancy. Like you can see there's like some JavaScript in here, there is lots of text which is not from the article but from the navigation from different things so basically most of this is not the content of the article which we are linking here because we actually uh, want to get content about some blog uh, about headless seo um, and most of it is just random stuff and somewhere here in here yeah the the article is beginning that is like more than half the content is not the article and it, also at the end there's lots of luggage again and that means that if we count the um, the tokens, we are already at three thousand five hundred tokens. So yes, this can still be uh, can st uh, be sent to ChatGPT, and um, we can ask a question about it. But we are already um, at a high token count, so it will be very expensive. Um, and just imagine that we don't only want to ask a question about this one source, but now we have ten websites, and we want to get information from all 10 of them and have the question answered. Then we are getting into uh, yeah, yeah, lots of issues and yeah, let's now, now make it 100 or 200 websites and we will even um, exceed the 120, uh, the 128K tokens that ChatGPT4 can handle and also no one wants to pay for that. So that's where retrieval augmented generation comes in. Um, basically what this does is um, it stores um, the, the source data. So for example, everything we have from the website here um, in a vector database first. And then uh, using embeddings, which are like a tokenized representation of the data, we can do a search to find similar things. And so in this case, we want to know who Lydia Infante is. This is the author of the article and there's some information about her in the article. So. 99% of this article is irrelevant or this content, but there are some parts at the end of it where, um, and, and other parts where some information of her is, like, like here, this is her website. And we only want to do that. So what um, having a vector database um, or vector data helps us is that we can actually find those pretty efficiently, those parts that we need, and then we can feed them back to uh, ChatGPT and only those parts. And let's quickly jump ahead to that. So basically this was the question with Lydia Infante. And once we do that, we are only returning this content to ChatGPT. We are giving it um, a text about here, I'm the senior CEO manager at Sanity, a modern headless CMS, you can follow me Lydia Infante, and some more information. And this is still not all super relevant, but everything at least contains her name and the big thing, the most interesting thing about this is now we are down to 515 tokens from 3,500 tokens. So with this simple graph here, we can already return much less data. And we could even, even get this value 
smaller by improving upon it. But I want to keep this as a simple example that is understandable. And so in the end, what we are doing is we are feeding our question plus our filtered information, so only what we got from the vector search, to ChatGPT to ask it um, uh, to build a prompt to is Lydia Infante and give it the information. And then yeah, we have a simple um, system prompt which just explains that it's helping to answer the questions and how it's supposed to answer them. And now with this data, it can answer our question pretty nice, as we can see here. Based on the information provided, Lydia Infante is the CEO manager at Sanity, background in business psychology, and so on. Okay, so yeah, we, um, we are going a bit from the other way around. Now you know what it does, but of course you don't know how it does it yet. So let's just straight jump into it. I will skip this scrape with HTTP call part because that is explained in the other video. But we will now start with this subgraph here, store data in vector storage, because before we can search on the data, we first need to store it. And as you can see here, we are sending two things in here. One is the content, so basically the, the content of the website we scraped, and the second one is the URL. And let's go into the subgraph. As you may note, uh, Rivet is getting a bit slow because the embeddings are creating lots of data, which is in the history of the, which you can see here, everything, and this is slowing it down a bit. So I could make it quicker by um, going to clear outputs here um, and speed it up. Um, but yeah, for the, as you can, you can see better like this, so we'll keep it even though it's a bit laggy at the moment. Okay, and basically here we are doing two things. Let's go start here. We're taking the URL, and we are using it to create a data set. And data sets are basically everything you can see here in Data Studio. So we already created lots of different data sets. And please note, I do not set the data set ID, so it's dynamically doing it. That's also why there are now multiple data sets with the same ID. I could have done it differently, so that has the same ID, um, so it can only be created once. Um, yeah, it's it's basically it can be done differently as well. But this in this case we are have getting a dynamic ID here. So this is where we want to store the data. And then before we can store the data, we of course need to to split it into smaller parts called chunking. Uh, and there's this chunk node here. And as we can see, we can um, decide which model is doing the chunking. Um, this is yeah, um, and how it's being done. And we can decide how many tokens a chunk is. So that is basically how long the text will be that's being separated. Um, I think super roughly a token might be like around a word or something, but it's not exactly like that. It's more complicated. Um, and then we can also say how much percentage the tokens are supposed to be overlapping. We will see why this plays a role in a second. But basically what it does now, it gets this input here and as we can see, it splits it into smaller parts. So this is one 100 token part and, and the next one and so on. And uh, also now with the text down here, it's all being split up. But we are not doing it very smartly as you can see here. It's just also cutting text into half. So um, we could do this all. I mean, this this are our improvements we could do, but for now we're doing a basic example and this is good enough because yeah, because we have an overlap, so the sentence will always finish, and also because, yeah, it works, it works. So it's good enough for the moment. Okay, after we get our chunks, so now we have, uh, as you can see, we have 51 chunks now, 51 parts. We are going to create embeddings uh, subgraph. And very important, this subgraph is set to split. So it will be run once per um, chunk. And also very important, we need to change the max value here because the default is 10 and we have 51 chunks. So if we do not change this, we would only get 10 embeddings and it would not work. Let's go into this graph. Uh, it's fairly simple. Now, we, as we can see, we are sending 51 chunks in here. It is running 51 times. And let's also see somewhere there's also a relevant text in here. here. Um, and what we are doing now is we are just running a get embeddings function. It's very simple. There's not any, not really anything to, to set in here. We are using the open AI um, embedding function, which is fairly cheap. And uh, we are sending the chunks in there and we are getting embeddings out. And we are also sending the chunk out here. 
because we need to have both together. We need the embedding to be able to search it and then we need the, the original text to be able to return it to the AI later. Okay, um, let's go back. So we have done the create embeddings one as well. And now it's fairly simple what we are doing. We are just appending um, all this to the data set. And our data are the chunks. So this is the, the raw text that is still readable. I mean, at least if it's not some strange in JavaScript. And then we are also adding the embeddings. And of course, we are adding all this to our newly created data set. So that's why the data set ID is going over here. And now if we go to Data Studio, it will look like this. So we have one table uh, we're creating uh, with our data set name and as randomly generated ID. And then we have all the chunks in here in a, um, as a row. And also the IDs here are also getting randomly generated because we do not set them. Um, or maybe we just don't care. And then there's this symbol here, which is not very <laughs> self-explanatory, but basically if this picture is here and if, if we do uh, hover it with a mouse, we can see that this is the information that there is also an embedding stored for this data set. And once this is there, we can even already here do some, um, some semantic search. So maybe, let's see what other information we have in the text. Maybe we want to search about content management system, about CMS. Let's see, now we have done a search and we can see that it gives us a ranking and has given us lots of results which might be applicable. And this ranking is basically, uh, yeah, this is the most matching one. So we can see here it even starts with CMS and it is definitely to having this word multiple times in here. And then um, as this drops, the it gets more less likely that it's in. And also if we just search something that is not in this text, like automobile, we should probably get no results. Uh, even though it's still returning something, I'm not sure why, but, but basically that's the idea. So we have a semantic search which can now be used. And of course we're not doing it here. We will now do our semantic search um, in the graph. So back to the main graph, we have now done the storing of the data in the vector storage. And now all that is left is going to be to retrieve it. And for this, we are sending two things into the subgraph. We need our question. So what, what, uh, for what do we need to retrieve data? And we need our data set ID to know where we are retrieving, we're trying to read the data from. Let's go to this subgraph. Here we have those two inputs. And now um, this is a fairly simple thing. First, we also need a, a tokenized representation of our question. So we need to also get an embedding for this one. So we're sending the question in here and getting it. And then we have already the data set ID in our graph input. And with both of those values, we can now do a K nearest neighbor search, which is like a yeah, standard vector search, the one I just showed you in the data studio to get our best um, matching uh, results. And very important here, we can actually decide how many results we want. That's also why I said we can probably reduce the token count. We could also only give the top one or two results to the AI if this is good enough. But with five, we are very safe that um, we will get all the most relevant things. But yeah, basically we can now see it returns us the uh, same things as we saw before, this data here. So, okay. Um, we're not really interested in all those additional meta information like ID and distance. So we are now using extract object path to just get the data field. And as we can see here now, now the first entry is actually just text, which is already helpful. And in the end, we are now having multiple parts. And yeah, that's all our output for this graph. Back to the main graph. Now, first of all, just for information, we are calculate, I calculated the tokens here. We already saw that before. So basically those two graphs here, this on the right part can just be ignored or removed. But what we need to do now is build our final prompt for the shed. So as we also already saw before, we are putting together the question and the data, sending it in and, and we're getting our answer. And yeah, that is basically it. Um, this, there's lots of use cases for um, handling this. Usually you might also want to store big amounts of data first. Maybe you want to read 
like um, lots of data from PDF files or from some text files and store them in advance and then have um, the ability to search on them. And there is also uh, future um, possibilities of giving the AI the um, op to the, the just the function and letting it decide if it needs to pull data from this additional source or not. But this is getting more complex and yeah, so basically it's function calling and this will be covered in another video. Okay, I hope um, this is helpful and you, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so please uh, leave me some feedback as always and of course like and subscribe and see you in the next one. Bye.